My name is Gnam Singh and I'd like to welcome you to another very special Sikh Think Tank on Punjab Broadcast Channel. In a speech in the Lok Sabha on August 11th this year, the Prime Minister of India, Mr. Narendra Modi, talked about a genocide committed against Sikhs in 1984 by the then Congress government. This is not the first time he and the BJP government have made this charge. Previously, Modi has talked about launching an investigation into the 1984 killings. But there is very little evidence and very little evidence of follow-up suggesting the words are mere political gesturing. You know, there is a saying, justice delayed is justice denied. But like an open wound, the consequences of denying justice can themselves create serious problems as well as we have seen recently with the Niger case in Canada. Today, 40 years after the Sikh genocide of June and November 84, and little prospect of justice, many Sikhs are either deciding to abandon India and migrate abroad, whilst others in India um, and amongst the expanding diaspora continue to campaign, up to and including the demand for a separate Sikh homeland, commonly referred to as Khalistan. International law on genocide is primarily governed by the 1948 Convention on the Prevention and Punishment of the Crime of Genocide. This treaty defines genocide as acts committed with the intent to destroy in whole or part a national, ethnic, racial or religious group. The convention obligates states to prevent and punish genocide and it established the International Court of Justice as a venue for adjudicating disputes related to genocide. Additionally, the Rome Statute on the international, of the International Criminal Court includes genocide as one of the crimes falling under the court's jurisdiction, reinforcing the global commitment to preventing and prosecuting acts of genocide. The link between genocide and self-determination is that a failure of a state to protect its population gives the right for the affected group, and in this case it seeks the right of existence from which they can make the case for self-determination. In other words, if by living in a particular place, your life is threatened, then you have the right to either escape or to claim freedom, autonomy from that state. And it applies to groups, not individuals. So to explore the intricate historical, legal and political issues involved here, I am delighted to welcome to tonight's Think Tank special, the Honourable Justice Dr. Anoop Singh Chaudhary, who has recently published a book uh, on this very same subject entitled From Genocide to Self-Determination, The Sikh Case. And you can obtain this book from the Sikh Missionary Society. So Anoop Singh Ji, Thwano Si Jiyai Aankhane Ya Wahe Guru Ji Ka Khalsa, Wahe Guru Ji Ki Fateh. Wahe Guru Ji Ka Khalsa, Wahe Guru Ji Ki Fateh. So thank you for joining us. I'll just uh, inform our viewers about your background. So Dr. Anoop Singh, He's a retired judge of the High Court of Uganda. He was born in Uganda in a place called Masaka. And his grandfather, Hari Singh, migrated from Rawalpindi, uh, which is now in Pakistan, to East Africa in the 1990s, having served in the British Army in the First World War. Anub Singh read law at Cambridge and received his PhD from Kampala University. And the thesis focused on conflict resolution and peace building. He's also been active within Pantak circles for over 40 years and was legal advisor to Dr. Jagjit Singh Chahan for 20 years whilst he was all uh, campaigning for uh, Sikh homeland. So Anub Singh Ji, before we go into the history of the modern day Sikh movement and the issues at the moment, the geopolitics, can you share with us uh, just a brief glimpse into the, how the book came about and what was your central aim in writing this book? I think that's a good question to start with. Uh, as you know, our history has not been written by Sikhs. Mm. Most of the time, our history is written by non-Sikhs and we are sidelined. Likewise, same happened with respect to 1984 genocide. Mm. And there was basically blame game, all kinds of nonsense, there was no truth that was exposed. So I came in 
I brought in the Sikh perspective and I wrote my first book which was called Sikh Genocide 84. It was about 995 pages. Mm -hmm. Now the book, the book was so popular that whoever saw it, whoever read it, became your friend. <clears throat> so basically, if that book was given to anybody, those people became your friends. Unfortunately, we Sikhs don't have the tendency to read and to appreciate books. But the fact is that I have set our Sikh, what they call a, a, a perspective in that book, and uh, nobody can challenge them. And that is the right thing, what happened to the Sikhs. And from there, one can start the rest of the dialogue and uh, debates and so on. Now, in 2020, I think it was during during the period of, uh, what is it called? When it was, all this bug came in, COVID. COVID, COVID, COVID yeah. So I was sitting idle and, you know, I write books from time to time. So I thought I write one on the, this Sikh genocide. Because a lot of people, I mean, a lot of people asked me, I mean, when you met the agencies, when you met other senior politicians, one of the questions was, uh, why do you want Khalistan? Uh, what is the problem? And so on. So, you know, at that point in time, you got to be able to explain to them. And then they would ask you, okay, what sort of country is it going to be? What sort of, you know, uh, setup is going to be? So now mm -hmm. you have to be able to explain to them in order to have credibility to your claim. So that's how I started those books. And then this book I wrote recently, which is about 152 pages, takes about an hour to read, and whoever will read it will understand the Sikh point of view. Okay, no, well, thank you very much. And of course, uh, the book actually has a forward by uh, no other than Alex Carlyle, Lord Carlyle of Berry, who actually was the former independent review of, of terrorist legislation. So, uh, Singhji, it's quite significant that Alex Carlyle has written a very glowing uh, forward to this book. And in fact, he says, he says, it is my hope that this book encourages meaningful conversations that lead to positive change and the promotion of harmony and unity in India and beyond. So your, your book, in a sense, as Alex Carlyle says, is not an attempt to somehow create conflict, but quite the opposite. What, what are your thoughts about that? Well, first of all, I don't believe in conflict. Hmm. My PhD was in conflict resolution and peace building. And as you know, I'm a sort of person who like to unite people, not to split people or break people or cause conflicts. Now, it is fundamentally important that we as a community, as a nation, whatever you want to call it, are able to live together. Now, this world is full of conflict. I mean, it's shocking, you know. Uh, there is so much conflict in this world. And uh, the question is, how do you resolve it? And most of the conflicts happen not because people hate each other. It happens because of selfish reasons. And that's how the conflicts start. Now, the, the same has happened with the Sikh conflict. I know that um, in terms of the structure of the book, you begin by you know, giving us a historical context. So maybe just um, you could give us a summary of uh, the, you know, the events, really, that both led to the demand for Sikh self-determination, but also possibly justified those demands in terms of the genocide. You know, uh, how think, did 1984 and Operation Blue Star really shape the events? Well, I think uh, my book makes it very clear. Uh, if you look at the back back page, you know, you always give a summary of what the book is about. And uh, in my book, obviously, I've shown that this book deals with desire for self-determination, uh, 
in the Indian state of Punjab. Uh, security of Punjab of Indian state, it discusses that. Economic well-being of Punjab province in the Indian state and immediate role, role of foreign interventions in the conflict between the Sikh community and the Indian state. Now, those were the aspects that came out of the 1984 genocide, which I have summarized in this book. Okay, I know that, uh, you know, clearly there are two aspects of the book. There is the, the case of the genocide, the issue around genocide. And then there is the kind of, uh, as it were, the response to that is self-determination. But in what ways has the international community acknowledged or even addressed the incidents of genocide amongst the Sikhs? I say that partly because, you know, if, if I'm really honest, there hasn't been too much uh, response from governments, from individual activists and MPs in all countries, but states have tended to stay quiet about this issue. Why do you think that's the case? <laughs> it's a good question. Uh, well, I suppose uh, we have not been able to present our case properly because, you know, just having demonstrations and uh, and uh, whatever else you want to call it doesn't help. What we need to do is to present our point of view, explain to them, you know, our perspective. And that is something which we are not, not been able to put forward. I mean, this requires intellectual input mm. and that's where people like me have come in i mean i have tried to explain our Sikh point of view the Sikh history uh, in the book actually it starts from the birth of guru nanak how we, we as a community moved on and how the you know pressures problems we had it's finally uh, culminated in the genocide of 1984. So what you're saying in that sense is that there's a deep ideological rift between the outlook that Sikhi provides uh, in terms of how society should be built to run uh, issues around justice and the kind of the kind of regimes from colonial regimes. You could go back to the Mughal periods and of course the British period. And now people argue that we've we've got the Hindutva period. So in some senses, it's very difficult for Sikhs to stay quiet in, in and, and, and therefore will become victims of state violence. Is that what you're saying? Because of our Absolutely. ideological position. If you, look, if you look at our history, mm. that is what has been going on in the history and up to today. And uh, that is what culminated in the determination uh, of uh, self, uh, what is called self determination, so that uh, we can be our own masters, our own rulers, and we can have our own narrative. And that is fundamentally important. We don't want to keep on begging from others, oh, we want this, we want that. No. What is, what is important is that we have our own home. And we are free to do what we want to do in our own home. Well, I'll come to the that, that afterwards, but I still want to explore the historical context. Uh, you know, we said that you were advisor to Dr. Jagji Singh Chahan for 20 years. And I know that uh, Dr. Chahan was busy publishing currency, making passports. But uh, to, if I'm honest, most people thought this was just joke. It wasn't, wasn't taken seriously at all. Uh, so, was I mean, were you were you advising him to do these things? And um, you know, he didn't really make any traction whatsoever. He talked big, but and he ended up back in India. He reconciled himself with the Indian state. Well, I think these were political gimmicks, and they do put a psychological impact mm. on the enemy. So it was just uh, you know one of those things. I certainly did advise. I certainly wasn't party to him printing the stamps and the and the notes, currency currency notes, but I certainly did not uh, object to that because it's one of those gimmicks, you know. It is there to raise the spirit of the movement that oh we are 
we are not dead. We are still alive. Okay, you said that it's important to understand the historical narrative, yeah, that we really need to. And in fact, you've done a brilliant job in your previous book, your 900 page book, where you've gathered all the kind of evidence, the, the published evidence, the reported evidence. So it's a fantastic resource. And, you know, uh, in terms of how those events were reported in various media across the world. So history is important. Yeah. So if we look at the sequence of events, uh, Baba Jan Singh and the 1984 uh, struggle the Kalis were leading was not not for self-determination in the in, in the sense that Jahan was talking about that. It was for Anand Mata, for greater autonomy and, and for a true union of Indian states. Um, it wasn't secessionist. So, so in terms of the historical process, wasn't Jahan really out on a bit of a limb? Wasn't he just a one-man arm a band that really didn't achieve any success whatsoever? Well, somebody had to start the movement, and that's what he did. But he was not in in the business of trying to break up India. That was not his philosophy. His philosophy was that we should all uh, have one a union whether it's India, Pakistan, Nepal, Afghanistan, Sri Lanka, Bangladesh, should all come together. Mm. Economically, we shall be strong. And we should have mutual respect for each other. So that was his philosophy, basically. He didn't believe in you know, breaking up India. And the question of breaking up India doesn't arise. I'll come to that later. So let me just clarify that. So his demand for Khalistan was not a demand for a separate country, but it was to have greater autonomy for the region that he might define as Khalistan within a bigger union, yes? Well, the, I should take you back to 1947. Why did we become part of the so-called India, which was created in 1947? Mm. I ask you one question, and the answer is very simple that we were promised an autonomous state in northern India. Hmm. Agree? I think that is a fact, that is the history. And after independence, what happened? When Tara Chand Malhotra, whom we call Tara Singh, Master Tara Singh, when he went to Nehru and asked him, what about our autonomous state? And the answer was, Sardarji, time has changed. Hmm. Agreed? So that's what happened. So this demand for continuous autonomous state continued. First it was by way of Punjab, Punjabi Suba state, then Pindravala came, Kapoor Singh created the Anandpur resolution asking that we shall be autonomous, uh, remain within the India and so on. And that was initially a way to be part of the Indian subcontinent. Since we had been made part, since we had been deceived and we are made part of it. But nevertheless, we still try to reconcile, making sure that our rights were preserved. And that did not happen. So whether it was Chohan, whether it was, Chohan, whether it was Pindrawala, the objective was the same, to ensure that what was promised to us before the independence was now achieved. But but you could argue that uh, past promises mean nothing because um, you know empires come and go, deals are done and broken. Uh, Ranjit Singh had his empire, and then the British annexed the Punjab. We know the history, uh, yeah. but but that you have to live with the kind of political context in which we live. We can't, as it were, live in a historical past. But let me just come to this this case for self determination because, in a sense, uh, this is the kind of crux of the issue. This my sense is there's two ways in which anybody can get political independence from any state. One is to fight, you know, civil wars, and you know about what happened in Yugoslavia, the Balkans, and you know we got the breakup of the Balkans, uh, and you know, in fact, the, the Americans were involved and others. Uh, and, and, and in some senses, I suppose, in the 1984 period, Sikhs were involved in a kind of an armed struggle, if you like, although many Sikhs say that it was just a defensive 
struggle and that they were just trying to survive state genocide. But what is the case for Sikh self-determination in within the framework of international law? You're, you're a lawyer, you're a judge. Within international law, can have Sikhs got a case? And you know how would they make that case? Well, Sikhs have a very good case. First of all, they are a nation. They have got their own symbols. They have got their own national anthem. They have got their own flag. The Indian flag came 70 years ago. Our flag was there 400 years ago. The Sikhs uh, have uh, uh, their own army, military, whether it's Nyang Singh or whatever, they can create it. They can create one. Sikhs are the finest soldiers in the world. Sikhs have their own music. Sikhs have their own spiritual music. Uh, Sikhs have, you name it, the Sikhs have, which most nations don't have. And we are already a nation. We have our own land. We had uh, our, our empire spanning from Afghanistan to the borders of China. We had treaties with China, which are still functional, which are still there. And under the treaties, we gave Ladakh and Tibet to China. And those treaties are still there. So it is not that we are just like African countries, which they, you know, came through a blind and said, here, this is, this, this is that country and so on. No, our country was there, it is still there. We have our holy places, we have our spiritual center, the Varsab. You name it, we have it. So it is not, and we have our own civilization, and we have our own ideology, and we have our own philosophy. And that is most important to understand, which the Western world is now beginning to understand. Okay, let me just uh, interrogate, explore this a bit more, yeah? So if, if as you state the case, the Sikhs are a nation, they, they, have, a, they have history, they have the symbols of nationhood, uh, then, and they're a nation without a state, maybe, yeah? So yeah. why hasn't the UN recognized the Sikhs officially in the way in which, for example, they have recognized the Palestinians and other, other people in the world who are struggling for autonomy? Why has, has there been no official recognition of the Sikh nation in the UN? Sikhs are on the way. The referendum 20 is going to do that job. The referendum 2020 is going to do that job and it is doing. And, be, and through this referendum under the United Nations EGs, uh, I mean, the thing will go to Security Council. And then from there, there will be a vote in the Punjab. You know, they say, they say, well, there's nobody in Punjab who's asking for Khalistan. Well, that may be so, but do the referendum and see how many. And you'll get, you'll get the answer, right? So my so understanding what, is, you, my understanding is that in order for you to uh, uh, make the case in the UN, you need a sponsor, you need a nation, a country that sponsors that, yeah? To, to as it were, act in proxy. There is no country that will make a case for oh, Khalistan. You know, you, you will have some, no, no. But first of all, I don't think that is, an, that is the case. Uh, if I'm wrong, I could be wrong. Uh, but in this particular aspect, I suspect now you see under under the 2020 referendum, there are some high-powered people in the in the panel who is conducting the referendum. For example, we have a former advisor to um, President Bush, and there is the advisors when Scotland referendum was taking place. Uh, a number of other senior people are in that panel which are conducting the referendum now they will then take the matter up in the security council and from there under the right to self-determination which every community has then they're going to decide you know how to get the referendum done in Punjab and once that is done if they say yeah we don't want to stay with India and that will what happen, like Sudan, Southern Sudan, and uh, in, uh, another country was Timor, and, and they will become independent. So that is a, a way which the Sikhs are now, you know, going ahead with. 
So one of the one of the uh, uh, you know when I started the program, one of the legal um, arguments for self determination is genocide. Yeah, it's genocide against a community. Yes. Um, but as far as I know, the UN hasn't even recognised uh, that there has been a genocide. The Indian state, uh, you know, politicians mentioned it. Even Modi recently in Parliament mentioned it. But there has been no formal recognition of any genocide taking place. And in fact, the narrative is still that this was simply a group of extremists who didn't have popular support amongst the masses uh, and that they were put down uh, and that was a legal uh, right of the Indian state to do that, to protect its own integrity. How would you respond to that? Well, I think uh, probably they didn't read my book, Seek Genocide 84. <laughs> So if they read, no, no, but, but that, my point is that if you've got so much overwhelming evidence, and I, and I've read your book, and I know that is, why hasn't any official legal body recognised it as such, associated with international law? I think no they country, have not any country, no country has recognised it. I think a lot of them have. Give me one example. One example. Yeah, which country has formally recognized? I'm not saying that the genocide didn't happen. I'm just saying that we haven't politically been able to make the case so that we've we've had any support. Even Sikhs in India now are embracing Modi as their saviour. Well, they have to, don't they? Otherwise, mm -hmm. they will be sent to uh, Dibrugar. In, they'll be, they will be deported, sent into exile in Dibrugar in Assam. Mm -hmm. Is that what you're trying to suggest? That they should not speak against Modi? <laughs> hmm. So, so let's to avoid going to Dibrugar, they should not. They should keep quiet and feel suppressed and sit down appealing. So, so what, in one of the chapters you actually provide a pretty detailed. Um, it's in the appendix, uh, almost a constitution. You call it the instrument of charter of Khalistan. Uh, just tell me a bit about this. I mean, what what is the aim in setting out this? Charter in which you talk about the Sikh civilization and, and the various ideologies. You know, what is Khalistan? What is what is it? You know, what is it? How is it different from India or Pakistan or any other country that we know today? Well, I think uh, one of the purposes of writing this book, as you will see, hmm. right at the beginning, I've talked about two civilizations, <coughs> and that will give you the answer to the conflict which happens all the time. One is the Sikh monotheistic civilization and one is the Indian polytheistic civilization. And the whole problem is a clash between the two civilizations. And then you can elaborate from that and move on from there. And that will give you all the answers that you may have under the sun. So this notion of the clash of civilization, of course, Huntington's, uh, he, he said that for him, the clash was between Western Christianity and Islam. Yes. Now, so uh, is this the same clash or is this a completely different clash of civilization? Absolutely, absolutely. You see, in countries, this is a clash between Hinduism and Sikhism. Uh, most Sikhs don't understand the the crux of the matter and the crux of the matter is that the Hindu civilization wants to destroy Sikhism just as they did to Buddhism, mm. just as they did to Buddhism and that is the plan which they have. Now take it for example, the next day after independence, what did they do? They removed our Anand Karajat, right? they took away our language. Next, they did our genocide, 84. Mm. They couldn't kill us. They couldn't destroy us. They did drug genocide now. Right? Uh, this was all continuation of the uh, uh, destruction of, of a community. They tried to, they tried to change our history, our Gurbani, they did uh, the Bedbi, the, the, the of uh, 
uh, Maharaj Saru right from the day, right from 1947. It's not that it, ha it happened recently. It has been going on, off and on from 1947. So all these were signals that they were, they were trying to destroy us. That's where the Khalsa became more educated, realized what the sinister plan was, and therefore that is where they said we need to have self-determination. So again, let me. I'm going to explore some of the practicalities. Uh, and as you said earlier on, one of the reasons why maybe um, it's taken us 40 years to, uh, you know, get to this point of this referendum that you talked about um, is that maybe many Sikhs are not clear what this uh, self-determination represents. And if I listen to the various uh, activists, you find a whole spectrum of opinion from people talking about. Um, I don't know, the Akal Takta being sovereign and the, the SGPC being allowed, you know, kind of self-governance of Gurdwaras, through to other people who say, actually, it's really about more rights to the states and Punjab and linguistic rights, water. We know that even the present Ahmadmi party talks about Punjab's water, and uh, which many of those issues were in the Anandpur resolution. But nobody in Punjab is really talking about a separate country. Uh, it's only peop people outside of Punjab. And this is not one of the allegations that's made towards uh, to people like us, maybe saying, why do you, what right have you got to to, to talk about the, the future of those people in, in India and Punjab, you know, to interfere in the internal affairs of a, a sovereign state? Well, there's no interference in the internal affairs of India, we are interfering in our own state, mm. in our own Sikh empire, which is now what is left of the remnants of the Sikh empire. We are trying to interfere in that. Now, it's all very well to say, oh, it is all the Sikhs abroad, not in Punjab. Well, if that is the case, try and do the referendum and find the answer. You do the referendum and you will see what support you have for Khalistan. What happened to, uh, what is his name, uh, uh, Amrath Pal Singh, right? Hmm. Hello, can you hear yes, me? Yes, 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 continue. What happened to Amrath Pal Singh? All that he was doing was trying to, you know, baptize the Sikhs and he was talking for the independent Sikh state. And what happened? He was thrown out. So, but, but some people, some people would argue, uh, and, and, and I'm just let the listeners know these are not my views. My my point is to play devil's advocate here, that the Amrit Pal uh, was, you know, rousing the Sikh youth to take weapons, and uh, you know, you could see the images, they, and they attacked a police station and um, threatened you know, the security and that the Indian state had no option. The, if you're a judge, if this would have happened in this country, then the British police would have done the same. So, uh, you know, how can that be an example for making the case for independence? Well, first of all, if Amrit Paul Singh did anything wrong, he should have been charged and taken to the magistrates. And he would have a right of appeal uh, to the High Court. So that is basically uh, what ought to have been done legally. But what Amrit Pal Singh was doing was not arousing violence. He was preaching Sikhi. Hmm. And uh, of course, you know, when you are preaching, naturally, the, you will sound jakaras and so on. But that doesn't mean that he's provoking violence. Okay. I mean, how what do you, you, okay, what do you say? What are the allegations made against people who are fighting for Sikh independence? Is that really they're being manipulated by you know other forces, and specifically, you know, the the Indian media points the finger at Pakistan that this is a proxy war that the Pakistanis are uh, stalking the Sikhs in order to create inconvenience for India. And the India does likewise in terms of, you know, say, secessionist movements in Baluchistan, in Sindh, and other places. And then this is a kind of a friendly kind of a deal. 
So by creating this sense of the enemy on the other side of the border, you justify your own authoritarian policies within the state. Uh, so to what extent are Sikhs simply a political football in this kind of bigger geopolitics or regional game that's taking place in South Asia? I think this is all politics and we shouldn't take it seriously. What we should be doing is to worry about our own sort of uh, uh, our own sort of independence, how to revive our own state, you know, with the remnants of the Sikh Empire. That's what we should be doing and that's what we should be working on. I think that the other question you asked was, are uh, uh, Sikhs abroad? Is it, did you say Sikhs abroad are? Yeah. Look, I am of advanced age and I think you are likewise. Uh, but who is running the movement? These are people who were born after 1984. These are the people who were clean shaved. Now they have risen and said what is happening? What is happening to us, our sovereignty, our country? And you can see examples are uh, Deep Sidhu, Sidhu Musawala, uh, uh, the one in uh, uh, New York, what is called Pannu, Parji, Abra Jagmeet Singh, leader of MDP. You know, these are all youngsters who have come. And don't forget that our children today are graduates of the best universities in the world in the West. They are not like Tara Chand Malhotra. They are not like Master Tara Singh who betrayed us. These youth, they are asking questions and these youth are today spearheading the movement. So mm -hmm. don't underestimate them. Don't. That past has gone. Mm -hmm. Where people like you and me who ran the movement and you know you just have demonstrations and that's all that that era has gone this is a new breed highly educated westernized western thinking you know and they know what is good for their community and what is best for their community so don't don't bring those old ideas that this happened Pakistan is saying this, India is saying that, nobody is saying anything. We are independent. We are going to do what we want to do. Simple as that. Now, now let, let me, okay, so, and, and I say you make a, a, a powerful case for uh, Khalistan. You know, you, 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 you've got the instrument of Charter of Khalistan. You talk about constitutions, about territories. But let me make, let me put this argument to you to say that you know, the reference, and I've heard the 20 uh, referendum campaign, and their reference is, is legal, their legal argument is that we had a, a Sikh empire, yeah? And that uh, in 1947, well, actually not in 1947, that's when Punjab was split. But in the Lahore Treaty, uh, when the British annexed Punjab, uh, you know, 100, uh, 100 years beforehand, that that was the moment at which uh, legally the Sikhs, uh, could make their case that, uh, that the British illegally stole their empire. But the argument could be made equally that um, the, the Sikh empire, you know, was taken from previous empires, the Mughal empire, uh, Afghans and others, and that the history of the world is of empires being created. And then, I mean, the British could make the same argument. They could say, we need to go back and take over India or East Africa or whatever. That's not really a case for, um, you know, arguing for autonomy is that we had a past empire, so therefore we can reclaim the empire. And, and not, not only that, notwithstanding the fact that there were only 15, less than 15% of the Sikhs population were part of the Ranjit Singh empire. So, you know, wh uh, where's the logic in that argument? I think that argument doesn't stand. That we had another, there was another empire and there was another empire. The Mo of course, we took from the Mughal Empire. From the Mughal Empire, we became the Sikh Empire. The issue is not that. The issue is Barrowal Treaty. Correct? Barrowal Treaty was signed 
that when the young boy came of age, they will transfer the empire back to us. They did not. And what happened in 47? It was merged with a subcontinent. But again, we did not sign the Indian constitution. So we never acceded to India, a new country called India at that time. So that is the legal issue. That A, first, the British uh, breached the treaty, and two, that at the time of independence, we never signed the Indian constitution, never accepted it, we never acceded to become part of India. So those are two legal reasons. If, if you want to go by legality, then those are two reasons. Likewise in Kashmir, the Kashmiris say, well, the Maharaja Ranjit Singh had no mandate of the people. How on his own would he have, you know, uh, uh, gone with, the, with India? But the people of Kashmir never gave him the mandate to do so. so that's again another legal, legal reason. So if you want to look for legal reasons, you can find many. Another argument often that's made, the uh, counter-argument to this is that, you know, the Khalistan is, is seen to be, you know, focused in, in northern India, in the Punjab, you know, primarily around Punjab. Uh, some people, you know, extend that to the Ranjit Singh Empire, which is a much, much bigger entity. But, you know, the argument is that Sikhs are actually living across India. And they would say that even our Sikh gurus, uh, Guru Gobind Singh Ji was born in Patna and then left this earth in Haju Sahib, that our taks are across India, that Guru Nanak himself travelled to many parts of the world uh, and established uh, following. So, you know, the Sindhi Sikhs, uh, you know, and Mahara Mahara Maharashtra Devach, Hegea. So this argument, this very Punjab-centric argument, doesn't really hold in terms of the, the spread of Sikhs throughout India and that that this would threaten their their futures if if there was some kind of balkanization. So what do you say to that argument that that really it's not in the interest of Sikhs in India to have this uh, separate state? Well, I don't know if that argument stands. Now you're talking about Hazur Sahib and you're talking about Patna Sahib. You know there are gurdwaras in Nepal. There are gurdwaras in uh, Bangladesh. There are Gurdwaras in Pakistan, there are Gurdwaras in Afghanistan, in Iran. Uh, nobody stops us from going there. No, hang yes. on. In Afghanistan, they wiped out. They wiped out the Sikh population. Well, that, yeah, that, that is a different case because we have a regime which doesn't believe in you know, mutual respect for religions. And that's what has happened. But the point is, the point is accessibility, as you are talking about, uh, it doesn't mean that because we are in different states, you don't have, you are not going to have accessibility. Whether you go, whether you take a visa and go there, or whether you drive there or fly there, uh, it's a different matter. But uh, to suggest that we shall be cut off from the uh, shrine, our Sikh shrines, uh, is not true. We will not be cut off at all. It will be there. They will be there for us. Now, the, the point isn't that um, people might be cut off, but the point is that ideologically, uh, that Sikhi is Sikhi or Sikhism was never designed to uh, establish a theocratic status or a, a Sikh state. I mean, some people say the Ranjit Singh state wasn't a Sikh state in the sense that it wasn't a Sikh theocratic state; it was a secular state. I mean, Ranjit Singh gave. Uh, great credence to Muslims and Hindus and other people as well. So, within Khalistan, would this be a, a you know a Sikh governance, Sikh rule, or would this be a secular? You know, could a Muslim or a Hindu become the president of Khalistan, for example? Well, when we had our empire, we were only fifteen percent, and everybody was treated equally, and there were Muslim ministers. Hindu ministers and everybody was treated equally and it is said that that model, ruling model was the best in the world. It was a documentary by the BBC that the reign of Maharaja Ranjit Singh was the best model 
or any nation. Because everybody was treated equally. If we put the gold in Darbarsa, we put gold uh, on the Hindu temples and Muslim mosques. So nobody was treated equally, differently. Everybody had equality. And again, don't forget that the state was run in accordance with Sikhi. The state was run in accordance with the teachings of Guru Nanak. And what is what are those uh, teachings? Love, equality, compassion, mutual respect, tolerance, forgiveness, kindness. Those are the concepts of our statehood which shall prevail, which are compatible with the Western values. Well, and I mean, I think, that, yeah. That's that an impressive is, list. That's an impressive list. But if you read the Constitution of India, you will come up with very similar kind of aspirations, if you like. If you read the Constitution of Pakistan or Britain or any other place, you'll find similar aspirations. And you as a lawyer would know that, that you know, OK, Britain doesn't have a constitution. But, you know, if you look at the American, they, they have they protect those universal rights. Uh, and so if it's these universal principles that you want, what does that have to do with a, a Sikh state? You know, it, wouldn't it make more sense to argue for either reforms within India or for Punjab? Uh, the, you know, to have more power to enact out these kind of important virtuous principles. You know, asking for these and then talking about a set state seems to be, you know, a big leap. We are not asking for those aspects. We are simply saying the state will have those aspects. Hmm. It's different to have aspects. Uh, you can have aspects but they got to be practiced. You got to give evidence that they, they, they have those aspects were practiced. Of course, we have them here in the UK. Those aspects are practiced. We had them in our Sikh empire. Those aspects were practiced. And you have asked me a question. Well, will it be secular state? Or what will be the right of other people? I put them in my book, where you look at the Charter of Khalistan. And it's very clear that everybody will be treated equally and everybody will be happy. Now you're comparing us with India. You know what is happening in India. You know how Muslims are assaulted every day. You know how Christian churches, 400 Christian churches have been burned and Christian women have been paraded naked on the streets by Hindu mobs. And you know how we Sikhs, you know, have been treated by them for the last 70 years. So you can't compare us with a rogue state. What we are trying to do is trying to create a state where everybody will have equal rights and we will have the, 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 the freedom to develop and progress so that we could do that. You see, it will open floodgates of markets if we are created. Our, our traders will be doing business with countries like, you know, Asia and, and you know, Europe. Doors will be open. It's not like the what happened in far, farming and Dolan, where the farmers were being suppressed. That's not going to happen. People will be have the opportunity to develop themselves. That's what's going to happen. Okay. So let me let, let's go to the kind of process, the pragmatics. You know, we can all demand, we can all dream and wish. Uh, whatever we want, but at the end of the day, we're dealing with a very, uh, you know, difficult political situation. You know, Modi is as powerful <coughs> as any Indian leader has been. He, you know, he's got a, a huge majority, and he's now flexing his muscles across the world in terms of, you know, the economic power. Um, you know, the G20. He was there, uh, presenting himself as almost this kind of savior of the global economics. He claims that you know india now has landed a well it doesn't claim he it states the case uh, a ship on the moon that india is no longer a third world country it is a global player 
And in that scenario, you know, it's highly unlikely that, um, you know, a, a handful of Sikhs demanding uh, an independent state, mostly from outside of Punjab, are going to have any influence whatsoever in what happens in India. So how do you kind of progress the, 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 the project other than just having perennial demonstrations now and again? How do you progress that project? Well, I think the answer to your question, Russia, Yuri Gagarin, was the first one to land on the moon. Mm. And what happened to it? The Soviet Union broke up into 15 countries. We had Yugoslavia claiming to be the most you know, aligned nation. It was broken into six countries. But what happened there? We had you know, terrible genocides. We had terrible yeah. violence. Even today, yeah. the UN is there protecting the minorities. Yeah, this, is what, the problem. this is what, what is going to happen if a peaceful sort of, uh, uh, what is called? Transfer of power. Balkanization doesn't take place. And that is what's going to have civil war. Now, you see, in a country like India, if you look at it, they want to create a Hindu state. I'm in favor of that. I don't say no, because the whole country was divided on the basis of communalism. You know, divided between the Muslims and the Hindus. So the Hindus should have had their country. But unfortunately, they missed the bus. Because their father, Mr. Gandhi, could not handle it properly. So now after 70 years, they want to create a Hindu state. Uh, but, the, it, but the situation has changed. Now, if they try to create Hindu state, then six up north want to create Khalistan. And what about the largest Muslim population in the world? What's going to happen to that? And as Obama said, you don't treat your minorities well, India may, India may well fall apart. In other words, there will be balkanization. And I think the whole world is watching. You saw what happened to EU. They passed a resolution against uh, what was happening in Manipur. Uh, there are about 80, 90, 58 Muslim countries. You know, they have formed an organization trying to uh, check on the treatment of Muslims in India. So this, and, and again, countries like Vatican, uh, United States, they are also monitoring the interest of their own people, their own Christians. So the point is that, you know, if, if you want to live together, all the communities must be happy. The moment there is grievance, what happens is a conflict. The moment there is conflict, there is war. Okay, so, so, so we've just got about four or five minutes left. I do want to just briefly touch on the current situation with the Canadian uh, Indian fallout and um, you know Trudeau's allegation that the Indian state was involved in the assassination of Hardeep Singh Nijar. And this seems to have created quite a lot of fallout between the two countries. How do you see this in the kind of bigger kind of geopolitics of what's happening both with the Ukraine war and you know some of the um, what's happening in the United States and uh, 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 and the tensions between say Russia and, 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 and the West. Do you see this as a kind of crack? Do you think this is the beginning of the West being more sympathetic to Sikhs and their demands? Or do you think this is just a, a game playing? Well, first of all, when a leader of a country like Canada, and that particular leader is most popular in the Western countries. He is not a small man. He is highly respected by the Western world. Now when he makes a statement, it cannot be baseless. It must have some foundation. Right? Number two. Now to attack, attack Canada irresponsibly and abuse it is not very sensible. Don't forget Canada is a member of NATO. Canada is a member of the Five Eyes. 
and all these countries will gang up together they are not going to listen to India simple as that finally you have come to the Sikh issue you know the geopolitics changes and the world knows they can do business with the Sikhs the world knows that the Sikhs are the finest soldiers in the world and they have got something to gain to keep Sikhs on their side and of course it hasn't helped India when it sided with the Russians and that has also created a conflict between India and the West and the Sikhs are a big factor so, so, one of, yeah. so one of the hypotheses that often is presented by advocates of Khalistan, I think Simran Siman often says this, that actually by creating a Sikh state in that particular part of the world might create more stability because you create this buffer uh, between China and India and, and Russia. I mean, it, could, could Sikhs play the, this role of creating peace in the world because you said at the beginning that that's really what the aim is to create peace and reconciliation uh, but the kind of things that you're talking about is, it seems to be the opposite it's going to create more war and conflict you know balkanization you know when has in the history of the world uh, nations been created without any bloodshed you know I mean look what happened in 47 <coughs> well I think uh, my view is that a Sikh state or Sikhistan or Khalistan or whatever you want to call it would have been the backbone of India. But you see, the people of India, the majority, they did not understand. Their objective was, was to destroy Sikhism. Mm. But if we had our own state on the same model as a Sikh empire, it would have been a great asset to India. Of course, we see have nothing against India. It's just what we are saying is, allow us to rule ourselves the way we want, right? So, so I'm saying is that Sikh state would have been asset. Now what's going to happen? The Sikh state will be created again. That will be bordering China. And that's what the West wants. Mm -hmm. And they know that they will have the Sikhs who will be a, uh, do work against uh, mm. China. So that okay. is the something which they have to understand. But the Indians have lost their chance mm. to get Sikhs again to come and join them, which will not happen. Okay, the, uh, Dr. Sub, uh, we are now out of time. So I'd like to thank Judge uh, Dr. Anoop Singh Chaudhary, Justice Anoop Singh Chaudhary, for his very forthright views. Uh, and once again, if you're wanting to explore more about his own thoughts, this is the book from Genocide to Self-Determination, The Sikh Case. And you can obtain this at the Sikh Missionary Society. Um, thank you very much for uh, coming along. And um, just uh, Punjab Broadcast Channel uh, hasn't got its any political position. We are not for or against any state. Our primary purpose is to allow every view to be expressed within the law and that uh, you know we interrogate uh, every perspective and indeed we would be very happy uh, for the representative of the Indian state to come onto the Sikh think tank and make their case, make their arguments as to why uh, the Hindutva project is the best for the future of Sikhs and other minorities in India. So it's had a colossal dahaga, as they program the Tismartia, Equal Fair Justice Noob Singh Jodri Datanvad, Fair Milonge,